Hi, welcome to Outlaw Bookseller, and we're doing What's in My Bag at Raves from the Grave, Froome, Britain's finest independent record shop. Probably Britain's finest record shop. <laughs> So if you're not familiar with the format, what's in my bag is something they do for Amoeba Records in the USA, which is like a chain of indies in California and New York and what have you. So I thought we'd adapt it for Froome because it's a similar ballpark. And what I really love about Raves is that the fact that it's range. Um, as a retailer, as a music fan, as a music buyer for, you know, forever, um, I just love the fact this range. You can come here and get all sorts of things on CD, vinyl, they've got new, second hand. It's all beautifully categorised and laid out. The team here, um, Rich and Jim and the guys who are always really friendly. And, you know, and it's just a sort of cornucopia of delight. So we're going to see what's in my bag. Now, there is a website for raves but it tends to only have the newest sort of releases. There's a heck of a lot more here. You can always email the guys who ring them up. And if you're in the West Country, you really need to get yourself along here and you can get yourself a Reeves tote bag, as I have. And I'm just going to talk through some of my favourite records, really. And um, there is something I want to buy, but I can't find it. So I'll ask the guys about that later on. So without further ado, um, we're going to sort of start in childhood, really. And obviously I was born in 63, which is when the Beatles sort of got going big time. JFK assassination, Doctor Who, Child of the Atom, all that stuff and I didn't live in a street when I was growing up so I didn't have a lot of musical influences and we didn't really have a record player that's working in my house till sort of about 1970 maybe a little bit later but I used to go over to my um my two uncles my mum's two younger brothers and I would see their records and I would play them <laughs> I'd be kind of baffled by them really and something I just want to show, show you sort of two sides of that influence and the first side I want to show you this is an album by Atomic Rooster um, called Inhuring of Atomic Rooster and I do have this on vinyl and CD and funny enough it was my older uncle the one who generally liked more sort of middle of the road stuff he's a huge Neil Sedaka fan he's leaving me um, his Neil Sedaka albums in, in his work he's a massive fan um, and he does like some rock news but this is an unusual one for him and I was also fascinated by the cover and the gatefold and his prog rock of course and I think I did listen to it at the time on his stereo and I couldn't make any sense of it but it definitely had an influence because later on Everything like this I heard when I was young or saw, I ended up buying and investigating later on. And my younger uncle, Mike, he had a lot more LPs like this, Floyd, Roxy Music, um, all sorts of other things. And I speak baffled by them. I couldn't work out what the songs were about because they weren't pop songs. So yeah, so that was an important one. So that's emblematic of the kind of thing which was around when I was a kid and which used to fascinate but baffle me. And really, it sort of highlights the difference between pop and rock. To me, pop is universal, um, whereas rock is more personal and subjective. A rock song can appeal to one person, not another. A good pop song should have universal appeal. Of course, you get some rock and roll acts who make pop records, the odd pop single and what have you, and you get the odd pop act that'll make a rock song. But generally speaking, that's how I see the twain dividing. Moving on in my childhood, um, on the pop side, you know, I was just the right sort of age to be caught up by this band, ABBA. And I picked up this one because um, I don't actually have this on vinyl. I had it originally and back in the day it was um, it was Gatefold. And this is a late ABBA album. This is ABBA the album. And this to me is where it all fell apart. The ABBA I like is the early stuff. The sort of glam stompers with descending chord sequences, the rock and roll things, the sort of more poppier things really and I think in that way they're great the first two or three records are wonderful this is where it starts to get show tuney and the show tuney side just I just can't stand it it's awful like there's a mini musical on here called the girl with the golden hair and it's got you know um thank you for the music and all that stuff and it just got really twee and dreadful at this point I thought before that it was wonderful and naive and romantic and sexy but this is just like not good it's got eagle on you which is kind of proggy it's got some good synths on it but this is not an album I would endorse but I wanted to show you that and I shocked my friend of mine Farhan hey mate if you're watching he's a big Hawkwind fan we've never met we've bonded online over Hawkwind for many many years and basically he was shocked at my sort of um, 
detailed analysis of the ABBA phenomenon. Then came punk, which changed everything for a lot of sort of young music fans in the UK. And what I found was after about a year, I started to look backward at the influences which were upon sort of the various punk musicians and what have you. So what came before was kind of important for me. And there were various people who were really important I got into afterwards. And even though I can remember these sort of people on top of the pops when I was a kid, I didn't really understand them. And you're talking about things like, you know, Alice Cooper, for example. And I mean, a band who were really, really big for me by the end of the 70s was Roxy Music. And this is Stranded, um, the third Roxy Music album. As Brian Eno said, my favourite one and the one I'm not on. And I mean, I love the first two albums with Eno. This is the one where he left and Eddie Jobson came in on violin and keyboards. Um, and I find that this is the one I listen to the most these days. And, you know, they're just so stylish and it's the sophisticated lyrics and brilliant musicianship and fantastic songwriting you know Brian Ferry's lyrics were just absolutely astonishingly good and they referred to a kind of glamour which was sort of within the reach of everybody then as true glam and they sort of had the influences from people like the Vuvd Underground which are really important to the introduction to avant-garde stuff and of course Ferry was taught at art school by um Richard Hamilton, you know, who had connections to J.G. Ballard and Alison Smithson, the architect and all that stuff, the This Is Tomorrow group. So it links in directly with SF, you know, great, great record, kinetic energy, bags of colour, sophisticated lyrics and very sexy sleeves as well. You know, you couldn't do that these days, but those were the days. That's 73, of course. Somebody else who, again, I remember from when I was a kid, but I got into big time just after I got to punk was David Bowie. And um, I mean, David Bowie obviously was a portal into all sorts of things for, for all sorts of people everywhere across the globe. He let us sort of into the world of the avant-garde and the strange. He introduced us to Iggy and the Stooges and to the Velvets and William Burroughs, Andy Warhol. He was the conduit for all this stuff and his own music and of course was fantastic, amazing singer. This is probably my favourite Bowie album, Station to Station. And I bought this and Ziggy Stardust and Low probably all pretty much the same time in, I think it would have been 78. And I played them solidly for six months every night and these songs just stay with you. And of course it's got the occult stuff in here in Station from Station Tour in my room overlooking the ocean from Kirtha to Malkath, all that. And it's got sort of things like Word on a Wing, which is a very beautiful song about doubt and traditional Christian religion. Um, wonderful ballad, Wild is the Wind, which is a cover version. You know, this is probably for me the one, if I had to pick just one, I'd probably pick this one. Because with Bowie's arms, funny enough, all of them up to this point, they get marred by the odd cover version, which is ill-chosen. The cover version on this is immaculate, of course. Great stuff. So if you just buy one Bowie album to start you off, that's magnificent. And as I said, punk rock was a big thing for me, and the band who, for me, sort of really meant everything was The Stranglers. This was their greatest hits. This was TV Advertiser at the time on CD. And, you know, people forget they sold an awful lot of records. They sold more records than The Sex Pistols, The Clash, all the other punk rock bands combined. There is this debate about whether they were punk rock. Well, all I can say is back at the time, those of us who consider ourselves punk rockers, we bought their records. It's that simple. And the wonderful musicianship, the roughness, the fact that they were slightly older men, they were scary, you know, they weren't young guys like us, they were a bit older, they were more mature. And there was the wonderful influences from the Velvets and the Doors and stuff. And it's just great. So, you know, if you only ever buy one thing, buy Ratless and Ovechkis, their first album, you can still get this fantastic Greatest Hits album, which covers the entire of the Hugh Cornwall period. Hasn't been the same since, no matter what people say. And a seminal Greatest Hits CD. So they really were a big sort of thing for me. But there were lots of other great records around at that time. And, you know, it's looking back, it's an embarrassment of riches. So quite a few of the things I've picked here today are very, very much in that ballpark. And a record which I've returned to recently, and I do every few years, and I've got multiple copies of this, and it's a brilliant, brilliant record. And I think my only problem with this artist is that, for me, what came afterwards never matched up. So I got off pretty quickly, but this to me is amazing. And this is Elvis Costello, and this is this year's model. And I want to sort of emphasize Elvis Costello and the attractions, the backing band, with um, Pete Thomas, wonderful flailing drummer, 
um, you know, he's like an octopus, his arms are everywhere and really sort of great incisive playing, almost jazzy. And of course, he was in a pub rock band before that, Chili Willie and the Red Hot Peppers, who played sort of country music. And there's Pete Thomas, who had a long, long history in bands before that, prog bands, a band called Quiver. Um, and he left when they became Sutherland Brothers and Quiver, well done, <laughs> and lots of attitude. And the very wonderful Steve Naive on keyboards. And there isn't a lot of guitar playing on this. There's a lot of space in it, but Elvis is, lyrics, their incisiveness, their cynicism, their cruelty, their observational genius. I mean, it's so tight and taut. Production's magnificent. And I think that was my problem. And the next record came along, Armed Forces. The production just, even though it was Nick Lowe, Basher, it just wasn't the same, you know. But I returned to this time and time again. And, you know, songs like Night Rally and, you know, No Action, the beat, this year's girl, the, the 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 literary quality of the writing of the lyrics is just magnificent. I think in this period, Costello is one of the finest songwriters has ever been. And maybe I'll go back and look at some of the later point stuff at some point. People will urge me to do so. But, you know, I'm so enamoured of this. I love this record. It's fantastic. So this year's model, if you buy just one Elvis record, buy that one, The Attractions. What a great, great band they were. Also in that sort of period, um, we had, you know, this is a band who, you get this thing in rock and roll where you get bands who are well known for a particular um, LP or period or what have you. And it's not always the best representation of their work, of their art. And I think this happens with this band a lot because they didn't have the hits until their third album. This is their first album. This is Blondie's Eponymous. Um, debut album it's called Blondie it's produced by the very wonderful Richard Gotterer who's just great he was in The Strange Loves who recorded I Want Candy I think and he knew it to put a cathedral echo on things and this is such a literate witty clever funny record and the band are just great on this and it's weird sometimes you get somebody in a band who is like the catalyst and they don't appear to be that important but once they're gone the band are never the same with this this record it was very much um, Gary Valentine, the bass player, now known as Gary Lackman, he's written loads of esoteric books about magic and what have you, huge Colin Wilson fan, as was Jimmy Destry, the keyboard player, and really, um, this is really something quite special, and the singles on here are X Offender, um, Rip It to Shreds, and um, In the Flesh, now in the UK they were all gathered together on one 7 inch and there's a 12 inch as well and they weren't hits but these are their most intelligent and best songs the playing's magnificent it's, it's like an avant-garde record it's like a pop art record it's very witty and clever and you know there's these strange slices of life and the you know the <laughs> The song titles sound like headlines, and they're even more like that on the second album, Plastic Letters, which is also good. X Offender, Look Good in Blue, A Shark in Jet's Clothing, Ripper to Shreds, Rifle Range, Kung Fu Girls, Attack of the Giant Ants, and fantastic giant ants, giant ants. And, um, you know, maybe you had a giant ant to attack to you, lucky you, as they say. Um, but yeah, this is great stuff. Parallel Lines comes later, and you know, and it's got some good stuff on it. Picture this is fantastic, fade away and radio. But this is the real jam, you know, this is the real thing, you know. So if kids, you're new to Blondie, don't buy Parallel Lines, buy this, get under your belt. It's great songs the songs are just so magnificent and and Gary Valentine left after this and of course he wrote Presence Dear a fantastic single from the second album and he co-wrote X Offender as well so he was really important and um, they're still around now but of course it's just Clem the drummer who's marvellous and Chris Stein who of course went for a period of long illness and Debbie you know who was an icon to us all something you had then of course also was the the birth of indie music they'd always been indie record labels they'd always been around but of course it became a big thing and this is kind of the definitive indie record and it is and it's not because it was a bootleg originally the definitive indie record was the seven inch ep spiral scratch by buzzcox from manchester and remember it's buzzcox not the buzzcox it's buzzcox and this album time's up was only available then as a bootleg and I borrowed off my friend Beaver. Hey Andy, um, great guy, he was in a punk band in um, in my hometown. He was in school together, same class together two years. Band called, first they were called Addiction, then they became called um, Campaign One and you know, they, they're a great band and great, great guys, all of them. And this is Time's Up and again, this is the real thing because the beauty of this was that Buzzcocks, of course, their lead singer, Howard DeVoto, he left you know, just as they were, you know, the very, very beginning of, um, 
you know, sort of, since 77, you know, he, he, he was more or less all over. He decided punk was over, just as it was beginning for most of us. And then he formed Magazine, amazing band, one of my favourite bands. First three Magazine albums, astonishing. So this is great, and it's very, very rough. It's rough as a bear's arse, as somebody once said, and it's superb. But the songs on you, one or two of them turned up on the first official Buzzcocks album, and then their music in a different kitchen, which is produced by Martin Rushant, who also produced the first Stranglers albums, the first three. And it's one of the loudest records you'll ever hear. Great producer. Everybody talks about Russian these days in terms of the Human League and Dare. Well, yeah, whatever. But he did greater stuff before that. And this has got wonderful stuff like Orgasm Addict and You Tear Me Up, um, Love Battery. Um, you know, this is really, really good intelligent stuff. And Devoto is rather like the punk Dostoevsky. It's existentialist, writer, lyricist really sort of you know amazing guy but that sensibility that you get in things like notes on the underground like you get in the outsider like you get in sartre and in, in hansen hesse Ionesco, all these people he's part of that modernist tradition and it works really well with punk music one of the most intelligent punk records you'll get so time's up is kind of essential and now it's easily available which is great news and what else have we got um a band who I liked when I was a kid because they had one really big hit single um, in 73 and I borrowed off a friend and I played it and played it and played it and I never got round to investigate them further and then it must have been about 80, 81, maybe a little bit, little bit later, my friend Phil, um, he, I was up his house and um, and he said, do you remember Hawkwind? And he put on a compilation album called Master of the Universe. This is the first Hawkwind album. Um, which is just called Hawkwind um, and of course it's connected to Michael Moorcock. I wouldn't say this is their best album but this is where it all starts. My favourite album, album by them is Warrior on the Edge of Time. There's lots of Hawkwind videos on this channel where I analyse their songs and talk about them and their broader cultural references and when Joe Banks was writing his definitive Hawkwind book um, going back about 2014 he got in touch with me because he'd read some of my Hawkwind reviews online and he asked me my ideas and I said, well, Joe, you know, I'm a writer to my ideas on my own. And I said, but if you're going to do a Hawkwind book, make it a cultural biography. And I think he was thinking that way anyway. But I like to think that I sort of pushed him in the final direction. And I got a credit in the book, which is really nice. So Hawkwind, the ultimate science fiction rock and roll band. Um, everything they did from this one up until the end of the 70s is absolutely essential. There'll be a Hawkwind unboxing on the channel in less than a month when the new box set comes out. And if you've never heard them, try and get to hear the early stuff. If you like science fiction, it's really, it's the most important rock music. If you like science fiction, um, really, really great stuff. The lineup changed every single album throughout the 70s. So they're one of those more open-ended things. And what can you say? Swirling electronics, heavy riffs, lots of atmosphere, three or four lead singers, just magnificent. A whole world unto themselves, a whole universe unto themselves. I'm going to finish off today with some new wave. You should see these are all records from early in my collecting thing. And I, I've also got a theory about rock music that it was born in 1965 when the Doors formed them and the Velvets got together. And before that, it wasn't really rock music. It was just rock and roll and pop. And then, of course, by 1983, it was 18 years old. So it grew up and it sort of lost something. And this is something from the early 80s. And this is something I don't have on vinyl. And this is just representative of the great music that we had in the early 80s. And I'd like to talk about Japan and David Sylvian, but I talk about them a lot and I'll do something about them another time. But in the last few years, I've gone back to the guitar music from that period, the British British bands, people like the Kiwa, Killing Joke, um, Bauhaus, and this band, Echo and the Bunny Man. Um, this is Crocodiles, their first album. Um, just kind of psychedelic and at that point critics were talking about bands like this and saying you know Ice Warriors, New Psychedelia, that sort of thing and yeah and you know Mac a great great lead singer fantastic and I really like Heaven Up Here and of course there's lots of references to Clockwork Orange in their Corova label and in songs like Do It Clean and The Cutter and this is the early stuff and um, you know you listen to this and you think what is it about you know it's definitely got that psychedelic sensibility because I do like West Coast psychedelia from the 60s as well I'll talk about that another time so that's great so there's a few of the sort of records that made me I'll just say a bit more about raves um, do visit if you can if you come to the West Country and you love music you really you really must come here it's a fantastic shop and it embodies for me one of the best qualities of good retailing range 
staff who care and know about the product. It's more than product, it's culture. It's the selling of culture like I do in book selling. And the guys really understand all the forms. They're really enthusiastic about it. And it just goes to show that it's not the fact you're independent that makes you great. It's what you've got and the passion you bring to it, the professionalism, you know, and, and I really can't say enough good about it. So I'll do a little bit more shooting and see you some more. So that's what's in my bag at Raves from the Grave in Froome. Something I just spotted here while sitting in here in the nice little turntable room at Raves is this wonderful book by Andrew Matheson, um, Sick on You which is about a band called the um, Hollywood Brats, a bit like the New York Dolls, they were British, they never got anywhere. Their records are fantastic, and um, Andrew Matheson is rather like the with nail and I of rock and roll, and this is a proof, it's 10 quid, it's a real collectible, fantastic stuff. And, um, you know, if you've not read this, I mean, this is a great rock and roll book. I mean, there aren't many great rock and roll books, there's a lot of rock and roll books, and there's not many great ones. This is really good. It did win a prize, um, and even if you've never heard of them, never heard of them, you should get it. It's a tale of unbridled ego, and it's so funny. Probably the funniest rock and roll book I've read, apart from Deke Leonard's Rhinos, Winos and Lunatics, which is about man, which is a fantastic book as well. So do try and pick that up. It is still in print. It's a B format paperback, different cover to this. Fantastic. Funny enough, these cushions and this sofa, the grey and the orange, those are the colours of the first official Buzzcocks album, which works really, really well. Malcolm Garrett, I think, did the design. And this is the turntable room. Isn't it fantastic? You can come in here and chill out and, and um, play some of the second-hand records, see what they're like, grade them for yourself. I'm sure that's okay. Flame and Groovy, look at that, French Flame and Groovy single. Fantastic. I am looking for a Mellow Candle album, which I'm sure was here the other day. Somebody's probably bought it, but I'll have to ask the guys now. We've got all the great sections. Jazz. Soul. World. Look at that. Beautiful. Soundtrack vinyl. Yeah, there's the blues. Some sort of music, DVD and Blu-ray. Soundtrack CD used classical. This does, of course, all appear in my two grumpy old men who discuss SF go bookshop there. But I just want them to show it to you again. Look at that. Isn't that lovely? Yeah, so make sure you come here and you camp the West Country because it's absolutely fantastic. It's a great pub around the corner as well. It's a lovely tent room, actually. 